tuned in to the Andrew Lawton Show. All right, we will shift gears here. There was a bit of a development on the Freedom Convoy legal front last week. Now, I've been speaking on this show periodically about the seemingly never-ending trial of Tamara Leach and Chris Barber. They went on trial supposedly for 13 days in September, but it is now the end of March and their trial is still underway, although it's not every day. It's it's on and off. They'll do a couple days at a time and, and whatnot. But uh, it is easy to uh, forget that there are other cases that have a lot less publicity around them, but are still stemming from those same three weeks in Ottawa. Now, one of those came to uh, a bit of an end at least to some extent last week, it was the trial of Jason Vanderweer, Jay Vanderweer as he goes by. Uh, he was one of the participants in the Freedom Convoy protest. Now, one of his contributions, uh, and I, I only learned this after the fact, but let, let's put up the cover of, of my book on the convoy. Uh, so this is the Freedom Convoy, the inside story of three weeks that shook the world. Pardon the shameless plug, but the you can see there's a shed on the back of that one truck there. That shed was actually a rather uh, pivotal role uh, in the convoy. It was a multimedia studio. It was live streaming. It was doing all of that. And uh, there, there's a connection between that shed and the man I wanted to speak about in this particular segment. Now, uh, David Anbert joins me. He is a, a criminal lawyer, very prominent uh, commentator on Twitter as well. And he was the legal representative of Mr. Vanderweer. Uh, David, it's good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Uh, now, now I, I should just say, I actually testified in this trial, just by, by way of disclosure, and my testimony was uh, effectively my own experiences and things that I saw as a journalist covering this. But, but let me ask you what happened last week. What was the judge's finding here? So at, at, after the trial, you testified, you were, I think, on day two of what was ultimately a four-day trial. Um, there were different sort of pieces to the puzzle that came together, uh, different uh, testimony about the beginning, the middle, the end of the convoy. And ultimately, uh, we made arguments that a mischief had not been made out. Uh, certainly, Jason's participation in a mischief had not been made out. And even if it had been made out in the alternative, we argued that there were two sections of the criminal code uh, that permitted either one to act with color of right or one to act in the course of delivering a message. And uh, I, I argued that the evidence uh, certainly established that that's what uh, the convoyers were engaged in doing. Uh, the judge rejected all four of our arguments uh, and ultimately found the Crown had proven beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a mischief, that Jason was uh, was involved in it to the requisite level of attracting criminal guilt, and he did not find that there was color of right uh, or that the uh, other section applied. So he found uh, Jason guilty, and, and now the case, uh, I mean, it's you said brought to a conclusion it still has one more step is mm -hmm. uh, because he has now been found guilty regardless of what you think about that the court has found him guilty and as a result there will be a sentence that's going to be imposed uh he will have of course ha have the chance to appeal and that's something that he is looking into doing what is this i mean mischief was something that a lot of people who are not criminal lawyers ha had really first heard in the context of the convoy and i know it's not a new charge but what actually is mischief in a criminal sense and how does that apply to the freedom convoy where we've heard it come up both in uh jason's right. case and also the cases of tamara leach and, and chris barber and others right um okay so mischief we most commonly see it in criminal law involving the destruction of property you know, if you get in an argument with someone um, and let's say they, I don't know, they film, they want to record you on their phone and you don't like that. So you grab the phone from their hand and smash it into the ground. That could be mischief or punching a hole in the wall could be considered mischief. But if you go in and read the section, there are other ways in which a mischief can be uh, committed. And one of the well-established ones is by interfering with the lawful enjoyment of property. And I think that was the angle that the Crown came at this from, uh, that, that they actually had two counts that basically slightly different, with slightly different wordings said the same thing. One said that it, it basically interfered with the lawful enjoyment of the property, Wellington, Parliament Hill, uh, the downtown area, and that also it in, interfered with the citizens of Ottawa's 
lawful enjoyment of the property. And so, I mean, he was found guilty of both, but because they're so closely related, he can only be sentenced on one of them. Effectively, the conduct that leads to one inextricably leads to the other. And so he's only going to get sentenced on one of those counts on which he was found guilty. And so what, what is meant by interfering with the lawful enjoyment is that it, it was the Crown's theory that people could not enjoy the public property uh, downtown Ottawa, that roads could not be traveled, that good night sleeps could not be had because of the constant honking, um, that there was the inability to, uh, to access certain roads. Uh, and what's interesting about this trial compared to maybe some of the more high profile trials like you talked about the Tamara Leach trial is the Crown actually led very little evidence in this particular case. I mean, in fact, it led so little evidence, a judge even said that if it wasn't for the evidence, both of the defense, but I mean, we, w we wouldn't have called that evidence if they also didn't have some in their case. And the judge also pointed to the fact that Mr. Vanderweer had posted videos on social media himself. If it wasn't for that evidence, there would have been there would have been really no evidence of what the actual mischief was. Um, I mean, again, like the defense had to call the evidence because the Crown would have and did call the evidence of that Jason had posted. And so without any response, the, the conviction would have almost been been certain, at least on this judge's analysis of, of the law. And so we argued that they didn't really prove they didn't really prove uh, the mischief. And in fact, one thing that was actually interesting was you may recall there was a video montage that I put to you mm -hmm. about um, some misinformation that went on uh, during the convoy to such an extent that, that numerous members of parliament and the NDP and the Liberal Party kept talking about this arson case, arson. They kept repeating this, this lie that, that the convoyers had been involved in arson. I put that to you and there was actually a, a point where the judge intervened and we had to address this in your absence, uh, where the judge was suggesting to me that I was essentially, you know, putting up a straw man that no one was suggesting that anyone was engaged in arson. But my response to the judge was that one of the reasons we're trying to put this forward is that the Crown in other cases has asked the court to take judicial notice to accept without hearing evidence certain facts, such as the fact that Ottawa was occupied or Ottawa was the subject of, of this large scale mischief where people couldn't get to their homes or couldn't sleep at night without even hearing evidence of people saying those things. And I explained to the judge that whenever, if the Crown were to approach him, uh, approach the court and ask the court to take judicial notice, or even if the Crown wanted to ask the court just to draw inferences about the convoy, that the court should be very guarded to do so because of the prevalence of misinformation. That's what that evidence sought to establish. And I thought that that, that was clear to the judge. Um, one comment he made, which is going to be interesting to look at if this matter goes to appeal, is that in, resp in response to one of my arguments, the judge made the comment that said you'd have to be living under a rock to not be aware of the intrusion that this caused. And that's exactly what judicial notice is, that we don't necessarily have to hear evidence of it, that everybody knows that this is what happens. And that that's the type of, of finding that the court shouldn't have been able to make. And so certainly that's something we're going to look at when deciding whether or not to appeal. Um, well, in, just, in the to end, jump, just to sorry, jump in on that point, David, because one of the problems here is, is that you do have in a lot of these cases that I, I've seen come up, a case where Crown is putting the convoy itself on trial right. and applying that to the person who happens to be the defendant. And and it, it really happens irrespective of the individual defendant's conduct. And it sounds like that was really what was happening here as well. Well, to a certain degree, that is a an effective and an appropriate strategy of the Crown. And to a certain degree, that was our strategy to combat it. I mean, the Crown would need, if the Crown wants to go that route, they have to establish that the convoy itself constituted a mischief and also that the person on trial participated in some way, that they just weren't simply observing it happen in front of them, but they were in some way acting either as a principal actor in that convoy 
or as a participant or, or as a aider or a better of, of the convoy, a, as a party to, uh, to that. And so um, we actually liked framing it like that because if we could establish either of those two had, had, had failed to be done, that would have resulted in an acquittal. So our primary line of focus is to argue, look, the, the Crown is not established beyond a reasonable doubt, certainly not on the evidence in this trial, that there was a mischief. Um, and to whatever extent that there was, um, the convoy was there to, um, to deliver a message. And so under subsection seven of the mischief provision, you can't find someone guilty of that. And then even if that was established, they had to establish that Jason participated. And I think the judge was able to make that leap in the, in the sense that they found him to be a, a, a fairly involved participant in the convoy. So let me just ask you moving forward here, uh, not just in, in this case, but in general, now that a, a judge has found that someone who was involved in the convoy had committed mischief, that's the finding as it stands right now. Can that seep into other cases when Crown is making similar arguments? For example, the Tamara Leach and Chris Barber trial, which is already underway. Can they use this ruling to kind of help make that case against them that, oh, a judge has already found the convoy was a mischief? In theory, it, it shouldn't. I mean, and the, the main reason why is that um, every criminal trial is a trial on its own evidence, other than when a court takes judicial notice. Like, mm -hmm. like just, to, just to reiterate that point, you know, a court can take judicial notice that water freezes at, at zero degrees without having to call a scientist into court to testify in every case where that's, where that's a situation. There is um, a place for that process, you're saying. Pardon me? there's a place for that process of taking judicial notice. Right. I'm saying there are ways in which judicial notice can be taken. I mean, judicial notice can be taken of the fact that, that Wellington is, is located north of the Queensway and that, and that Metcalf Street runs north-south. I mean, these are things where everybody does, in fact, know this. There's no controversy. Any, any resources like maps or anything like that would, would confirm that. And so where there's no dispute, courts can find that. But in a, to answer your question, on the extent of whether or not something is a mischief, the court needs to adjudicate it on the record that's before it, on the evidence that's before it. And, and so I think that it would be inappropriate for a court to, um, to find that because one court found it to be a mischief, another court could do that as well. All right. Well, uh, sorry about the loss, but I, I know you're looking at your options and let's hope that uh, we have some sanity prevailing here. David Anberg, criminal lawyer in Ottawa and not a Simpsons character, as for uh, quite a while, his uh, Twitter uh, profile photo made it seem. David, good to talk to you. Thanks, yes, for, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for having me. And also thanks again for your testimony in the in the trial. It was it was quite well received. Well, always happy to, to talk about things I, I saw and observed there. So appreciate that very much, David. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.